SEK, so um, initially I was like learning from Daniel and uh, coach like Chris, Chris O'Keefe, I mean uh, Steve O'Keefe and uh, Chris Cruz. Growing up, they gave me free training, you know what I mean? So, like Daniel, from the age of 16, like he's, he's been giving me training for free, no pennies, nothing, even gave me clothes to train with, you know, Steve O'Keefe, in the same respect, like gave me rash guards and and jujitsu gear, uh, geese, back from from a guy who come from an area where obviously he's not uh, working class and not probably rich, and and uh, those things meant a lot to me. So, and seeing what sports done to me, it, it um, you know it changed my life in a sense of gave me a purpose. And uh, SCK was all about doing the same for others, you know. So me and CK we met maybe three years ago. Um, it was a matter of just the one day we was at the gym, um, it was after a jiu-jitsu jiu -jitsu session and we had a really, really tough round so we were sitting down like in between the rounds and uh, just talking about like how good, you know, jiu-jitsu made us feel, uh, the sport made us feel and just mixed martial arts in general and uh, we felt like there was not a lot of people, especially people our age and the youth and, you know, um, I would say Somalis in particular because SEK started off as a, as a concept for our kind, our Somalis. And uh, we was like, you know what, there's not a lot of Somalis doing it. Um, you're passionate about your sport, obviously. Um, Saber being an MMA guy, a striker, shall I say. Um, but obviously, he's now transitioned to MMA. And me being a grappler, we was like, we needed more people to um, almost um, um, experience what the feelings, the feeling that we have. And uh, yeah, we was like, you know what, let's 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 open up a gym in Somalia. That was the that was the first that was the, that was our main idea to open up a gym in Somalia first and then... Five seconds guys, hold it, hold it! Oh. Hold it, five seconds! Oh. Ooh, whoa! Whoa, time, time, oh, 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 oh. Remember guys, man, timing, come on! How many weeks are we gonna have to go through this? Alright, listen guys! We're doing body boxing! No, 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 no. Camera, camera, see, I don't want to hurt you. Just wait for the camera to Hey, hey, yo, yo, yo! It's off the wall, man. What you know about? How many times can I tell you? Alright, right, listen, listen, you know the rules of bodyboxing. Stay free when I'm here, so I'm going to run right hand. Okay. I'm going to even step out again. I'm going to run right hand, I can even roll out here. Move up, even right hand here. Um, step off. We found out we had something in common in the sense of we were very uh, patriotic, you know, in the sense that we, we loved our culture and Somalia, and uh, we wanted to do something for our people. And uh, obviously, we're heavily involved in sports. Him being a more, more of a grappling side, um, we came together and did the same for our, for our community. So we bought investing glo uh, gloves, invested in clothing, even in uh, equipment, paying for venues and and, and, a, and a space, and uh, we just had out free sessions for for people, for young people, for even those who are like, adults, working class, just like just so they have someone to go to and someone to train and have hopefully having the having same impact sports had in my life and hopefully the sports will have the same impact in their life. And I do a lap trap where I now trap his hands and I'm also securing the head and arm. Now both of his hands is nice and trapped. This time I'm going to square both of my knees now and I'm hit. I will try, try three arms. Mm. Try. Yeah? Hard. He's locked in. Okay? 
From here, all I'm going to do now is this hand on my right hand. So I've got one hand going across, right? So my right hand, I'm now going to bring it on the inside. So yeah. the um, I remember our really first session, arms, you know, we only, we had three people turn up in our first session, you know, and those three people that turn up, were our, were our friends. So I think one of them was my, somebody I knew and two of them were our Sabirs. And I remember just before the first session came about, you know, I, you know, I, I, me and Sabir would have this conversation. We'd say, hey, do you know how many people do you think is coming today? And, you know, four o'clock, we'd see just two people coming in, but we didn't care. You know, we, we, we didn't start, we, we, you know, SEK is not about numbers really, it's about who turns up, we'll train you, we'll give you 100%. One person, two person, even 10 people, we'll, we'll, you know, we'll give you 100%, we'll train you. Um, so it, the, the less, I mean, if two people come, it almost feels like a PT for them. Because we're not only training you, but we're giving you that attention. Do you know what I mean? And people loved it. And when they, when those two people that started coming to SCK from the beginning, once they start seeing the group growing, they were like, "Oh man, it doesn't feel like a PT no more, man. It feels like a proper class." And obviously, eventually, it it, it became a proper session. And now, alhamdulillah, we're we're, we're averaging twenty five to about fifteen to twenty five people that come to our sessions. All right, guys, guns, guns down. I got into fighting, I was 16 years old, I just finished school, I used to get into a lot of trouble in the sense of just a lot of fist fights and uh, I wanted to, I just wanted to know how to fight for myself really. Uh, I didn't know what martial arts to go into. I didn't know nothing about martial arts, nothing about boxing, nothing about anything. But I did see a, a, a YouTube clip of, uh, of Anton Silva against Forrest Griffin. And when he done a little head movement and his little combination and dropped him, I think it was the first round. Just, and I, was, I was in shock. I saw something like that, I said, like, what is that? You know what I mean? I said, I need to know what he's, exactly what he's doing. Um, so I found out that obviously he was involved in MMA, so he was fighting in a cage in the UFC. Um, so I thought, you know what, MMA is what I want to get into. So uh, I got a leaflet from my brother. He, he like, they were handing out leaflets, uh, offered five pieces, handing out leaflets. There's a gym in Newham, uh, outside uh, Newvik College, which my brother was going to. And um, he took one leaflet, took it home, gave it to me, he said, oh, I heard, you, I, was, I heard you wanted to fight, I heard you wanted to learn how to fight. There you go, I see it's a gym out there, it's three years old. Um, Sabir's been with me for I think it's about eight years now, seven, eight years. Um, he came in, he was very dedicated, he wanted to fight. Well, at first he was more like wanted to train and wanted to learn. And then he had his first fight and then he's, you know, he's just progressed and he's kept going. He's, he's, you know, he's very disciplined, he's very hard working and he's got that professional mindset. You know, I've put him through some hard tests you know, in terms of training, he's been through some hard fights and you know, he, he wants to do it, which is, the, which is the main thing, first of all, and he wants to learn, he wants to get better. But once he's got that mindset, which he does, he can push himself as he has done so far um, in, his, in his career. So over the eight years that he's been training with me, you know, he's done boxing fights, he's had MMA fights, he's had Thai boxing fights, and he's been successful in all of them, you know, because he's got that mindset and he pushes himself so hard. Beat up, um, and I thought, whoa, like, I don't want to feel this vulnerable ever. And I mean, I've, I always thought I could handle myself, but when I was in that session, I thought, man, I feel vulnerable. Like, another man, same size as me, just purely just, just took care of me without him even breaking sweat. So, um, that kind of took, uh, bring out the competitive nature in me. Like, I didn't want to feel that way. I didn't, I didn't want to be weaker or even less skilled than anyone have him around so I just kept showing up in the sense of just to develop my skill just get better sooner or later the coach just took uh, recognition of that of me just around every day uh, Daniel Sam thought you know what I, I think you're capable of fighting I said do you want to fight in a local amateur show uh, I said I guess but that was not my intention to to take that that route but I just did it because uh, my training partners were doing it because I became close friends with the training partners I was with um, guys like uh, Kingsley Crawford Guys like uh, Joanna Scott, Hasib, 
you know, guys I train with every day. And uh, I saw them compete. And uh, I thought, you know what, I wanted to, I wanted to do the same thing. So once, uh, once, once I went out there, I won, I won all my competitions, my amateur competitions in kickboxing. And um, I went on to, on to a more high class uh, competition, kickback K1, and more semi pro based C classes. Um, and uh, yeah, I just kept getting results. And before you knew it, they start, I started getting more love for it. The, com the stage of just competing, just to being out there and having experience, I started getting an addiction for it. And, uh, and yeah, and all of a sudden I'm here now with a lot of experience on my belt. And uh, yeah, I guess the journey is to keep going, it's still going. Uh, what did I say in Sabir? He's athletic, he's got very good cardio and he's got uh, a mindset where he wants to learn. You know, he, doesn't, he didn't walk into the gym feeling like you know, he knew it already. He, he was a, like a sponge, he wanted to learn, he wanted to develop new things, develop himself and he was uh, patient in terms of doing so. So he didn't walk in there and expect to be a world champion within a year. You know, he's put the hard graft in, he was doing his, his MMA training, his BJJ training, he's had, you know, as I said, amateur boxing fights, he's had Thai boxing fights, and he's, he's happy to learn and work, you know, work his way up rather than just trying to jump in at the deep end into hard fights. And, and you know, now once he's put that work in, now he's starting to see more success in his fights, his, you know, his technique is developing because he's got that solid background. He started off slow and developed himself rather than just jumping in, you know, um, which he could have done, but he's, he's, done it, he's done it well. I'll be real, I feel like most athletes that you probably meet, you have met, they never intentionally start off with the attention of, uh, I'm gonna go fight, I'm, I'm trained to fight. You know, the process was, was almost kind of forced in a sense, like you kind of get egged on by a coach. Oh, listen, it's a fight. We're gonna fight, and when you ask it to you in front of a lot of people, you you're gonna you can't say no. Really, is that I, that I guess like, and then you just do it. And for me, it was not in a sense of like I wanted to fight. It was more of like go and fight. You know what I mean? Daniel doesn't really ask questions. He just he gives out demands. So so yeah, once he demanded that I do a show, that was it. I just did a show. You know what I mean? So yeah. Like when it comes to your coaches, they have a huge influence on uh, on the choices you make in life. Simply because you don't want to disappoint them or upset them in any way. So when Daniel suggested that I, like I should compete, I feel like he knew what's best, and I said, "Yeah, let's go." Best asset is easily is your mindset. You know, you can have all the physical attributes, but if you haven't got the right mindset, you know, the dedication, professionalism in your training, in you know, your approach to it, it doesn't mean anything. You can be big, strong, but if you're not focused, you know, if you're not disciplined, if you're not hardworking, and that comes from your mindset, it, it, none of it matters. So yeah, the biggest asset is got to be your having the right mindset. For me, it's almost like a motive. Like when I wake up in the morning and I go to a training session, sometimes I'm excited. You know, I go to that session, I'm excited in the sense of I can see my friends, we get to work out. And then in the sessions, it might be all hard work and seriousness, but it's also a time of like bonding with you and your, with your training partners. And the training partners I'm with, we've been together for like, I don't know, eight years, day in, day out, experience the highs and lows, and they become your family. So training is like, it's really, for me, it's fun, man. It's fun, you get to work out, you get to improve your, your skill level and you get to be around the people you love, in a sense. When your fight is announced, when you get a little text, uh, we were trying to match me for a minute. A real, a lot of guys, 
they don't want to take the fight. I've been out for three years. I've been, I've been, but not out as in the sense of just chilling. I've been out competing for three years in different sports. And uh, my record is still quite low in the sense of it was just 2-0 no at the time in MMA. And I've had maybe 10, 11 different type of competitions outside of that. And that can be scary for anyone because they, they know that from those, uh, my last footage of my fight in uh, 2019, it's going to be completely different to now. Like as, as I've been competing and none of the footage came out. The, the kickboxing came out a few times, but they don't know how my grappling has improved. So it can be scary for anyone. So there was a, there was a challenge where the, fights were, the names were being offered. I would accept, I accept anyone that Sifu offers me. And I say, yep, give it to me, whoever. But cancel, they say, nope, they don't want to take the fight. I'm, I'm too big. Nope, uh, the guy is, uh, you know, he's, not too, he's too small. Or uh, no, he wants to fight someone that's a bit less experienced. Uh, you know what I mean? So it was, I was had maybe three, three matchups, and then having all three being almost cancelled out, and um, that part was stressful because I really wanted to go back to MMA, and I thought, like, if this keeps going on, I'm, I'm not gonna find no one, and I'm, I'm probably gonna fight on the show. Thankfully, someone stepped up, uh, someone who trained for, in, a, in a great gym, and, and he, yeah, he had a style where it's different to all my fights before that. It was, uh, he had more of a grappling style, style. He wanted to come get close and grab onto your legs and take you down, and then uh, and just have his way in the sense of his grappling. And uh, I knew that, okay, my striking is already superior, I feel like, to anyone. Is that, did that area, it's almost not not like uh, put aside, but I don't have to highlight as much in this camp. Well, what I had to highlight was my takedown defense and my and my and my wrestling and my um, making sure I get up and even my attacking in wrestling, you know. And uh, I had a great camp. I had a great camp with Muhi and Imran with it, and they were all both fighting on the same day as me. So, and they had opponents that were more striking based. So we kind of complement each other in that sense. So in the stand up. Like they'll probably um, gain, gain a lot from sparring me, but whereas in the grappling, I'll gain a lot from sparring them. And, uh, and that was the first time for the whole camp in Muhi, like a couple of days a week, and in round two. <laughs> this fight was quite big for all of us because. For Saber, it was the biggest fight of his career at that point. It was also the biggest fight of mine, but we were both preparing at the same time. We almost did everything together, um, preparing like it was always, like pretty much twice a day together, if not once a day at least. Um, obviously, now he's come down to flyweight. We're both kind of same way, you know, like everything we're doing together, and we're basically being good training partners for each other. Um, yeah, I think for him as well, he kind of had like a bit of a chip on his shoulder. I felt like, obviously he was away from MMA for a bit. Everyone just thinking, oh, he's a boxer, he's a kickboxer. Um, even like in his podcast interviews, that's like the vibes that, that I was getting listening to. It's that everyone thinks he's that. And even him at one point, he's saying, I want to show my grappling, you know. Everyone just thinks I'm a boxer. Like, and, and people would even ask me, like, oh, like, how's your boy's grappling? I said, don't worry about his grappling, he's okay. <laughs> He'll be all right. Um, um, well, Sabir, first of all, he didn't, He's transitioned over to fighting at MMA, but he was learning all of them at the same time. So when he, when he first started with us at Fight for Peace, he was learning a lot of uh, jiu-jitsu wrestling as well, as doing his boxing and, and his stand-up as well. So he kind of progressed with them all at the same time. But if you're straight stand-up and switching to trying to get into MMA, it's making sure that 
as much as you learn the, the ground game, you don't let that take away from what you're doing stand-up. And you find a balance in terms of being able to work your stand-up and then you know, mix it to, to the ground fighting as well without one taking over the other. Just try and find a good mix between the two. Um, very confident. I feel like people haven't even seen my whole arsenal yet. Obviously, people would like to see my wrestling. Because uh, my style, I don't wrestle a lot. I, I like to punch you up until you give up. You know what I mean? So, if there's anything I would like to improve on, it's more like if it's there anything I want to show people that I have, I would say the graphic aspect of it. I'd love to show them that I've been a blue belt for maybe four years now, you know what I mean? So I, I have been grappling, I've been training at 10th Planet in Jiu Jitsu, you know, I've been putting the, the reps in, and it hasn't come out my fastest yet, but when it does, they should know, they shouldn't be surprised, because I probably have more experience in grappling than the most guys I'm come up, come up against. So that's definitely something I want to show the world. When you put the knee and the hand, do it at the same time. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you know what it is, bro? You do the double leg, yeah? It's a bait to make them spread the legs. Yeah. You know, if, you, if you take the double leg, you're going to go like this. You know what I'm saying? That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah. Well, with Sabir, it depends, first of all, all the fighters, it all depends on what their opponent, who their opponent is, what kind of style that they're up against, that they're fighting with. So when we're in, as I say, keeping fit, we're Developing all of Sabir's skills, developing his punch power, his, his, you know, his punching technique, his ring IQ, his, his kicks. A lot of work we've been trying to do with Sabir is to develop his kicks. He wasn't the most flexible when he came in in terms of being able to throw kicks. He's, he's getting a lot better now. So he's developing his kicks, which adds to his, his whole um, stand-up fight game. You know, he can then throw combinations with punches, kicks, punches and knees together, and it can flow a lot more. So now when he's fighting different opponents now, we can, we can uh, kind of tweak his, not even tweak, we can concentrate his technique for the actual opponent that he's fighting. Um, so that's what we focus on a lot, making sure his fitness is very good, because that's one of his weapons, um, his cardio. He's, he's able to take fighters into deep water you know, and drown them, which is what I try and push for all of my fighters to do. I'm always you know, drumming it into them, take them into deep waters, and just use your cardio as a weapon. Um, he's got very good boxing skills, and then now he's developing his kicks a lot more as well. So he, you know, he's becoming an all-round complete fighter. <laughs> We want him away from the cage, yeah? Okay. We take him away from the cage. So you've got the option of that way or that way, yeah? And you've got two direction options here. Yeah. Backwards. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, whichever one you want, you feel comfortable. Step in, take him, move him away, away from the cage. Away Me, where I could put my two cents in, I put it. Um, sometimes, not sometimes, a lot of the time, it wouldn't even be from a technical perspective, it would be from a mindset perspective, it would be from experience. Because um, he, at this point, even though he's had, I don't know how many odd boxing, kickboxing, 15, 20, he's, had, he's been in the cage two times. Just two times he's been in the cage. In a boxing fight, it's all about output, especially in amateur boxing, all about output, point scoring. Whoever gets the most points wins. So if I'm throwing 300 punches and you're throwing 270, most likely I'm going to win, win the fight because I went through 300, you know what I mean? So it's all about point scoring. So the, the rule set is even different. And also you're allowed to work on your back foot, whereas in MMA, you have to, you have to be a bit more aggressive. Even in Muay Thai, you'll be more aggressive and you control the, control the cage, whereas that's not as relevant in boxing because you can be on your back foot the whole time. As long as you're outscoring them, you're winning. And then, uh, that's how to... Make, that's why my fights, especially in boxing, and MMA or, or kickboxing, I try to differentiate my styles. I try to use less head movement in MMA or kickboxing because the, the, the threats of kicks come on each, each side. And I try to be even uh, less bouncy in MMA than I am in boxing, because in boxing I can be more mobile, whereas in MMA, if you're, the more mobile you are, the, more, the less um, balance you may have when a guy is going for a shot and you're grabbing your legs. And you know, if you're not stable enough, you're going to go down. So there's a lot of things you have to think about 
especially drinking. That's why I cancel for. So when I prepare for a five, I've got six to eight weeks to prepare for it. And that's those six to eight weeks I prepare for that certain fight and making sure that I'm in that kind of rhythm going into that fight. So leading up to that fight, he's only been in the cage two times, maybe what, 20 minutes? I've been, in, I've been in the cage as an amateur 14 times. And then going on to that was my third pro. So I had a lot of things experience wise. It wasn't always about technical work. Sometimes it was technical, I'd give something. Sometimes technical, he'd give me something. But a lot of things I'll tell him, you do this, this is how a person reacts mentally in the cage, like, you know. Um, so yeah, like, I think my main thing, you know, we all helped each other technically. We'd all go over things. But I think that was the main thing, just from experience perspective. Things to do, not technically, but, you know, there's more to the fact than throwing a punch, throwing a kick. Sometimes it's like, okay, you throw a punch, now he, th what does he think? You know, like these kind of things. He thinks this, oh, he's near the cage, so you do X, Y, and Z. And yeah, I think that's where I, I, my input was needed most. Yeah. Yeah. If you're 64, what well, if you're above 64? 64, 64 and a half. You're 65 or above? I'm not going to How much did you drink? You can't Take that away and scale that tape. Now you haven't drank that much? Did you drink that look or did you have another ball? Before that, yeah. How would you move that? I don't know what's going on. Ah, I don't know what's going on. Ah, I for me, the only difference is the actual rule sets, you know, in terms of fighting as an amateur, for example, like you'll have some fights where there's no elbows or there's no knees to the head. But in terms of the actual training and approach, there's no difference. You know, I expect my fighters to have a professional mindset, even if they're fighting amateurs. You know, just because it's an amateur fight, it doesn't mean you start training like an amateur, you know, coming in, messing around, you know, taking it half hearted. You still train like a professional, which is why we get such good results, even at amateur level. You know, so the only difference, as I said, is, is the rule sets in the fight. But when it comes to the training, you're exactly the same. You know, you train like a professional.